I will once again Shalom Shabbat Shalom Senbet Salam and this is the tenth the tenth uh, Sabbath in this new cycle of Torah portion readings and feedings and this tenth uh, uh, Shabbatical or Sabbatical the Orit Nebab or the Torah portion reading and feeding is called Bechalam Bamarenya in the Amharic of the Metaf Kedus of His Majesty's Bible and in the Masoretic Hebrew is called Miket. 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 Now, once again, and we want to keep reminding ones and ones because maybe you didn't see one of the other videos that we talked about it before, brothers and sisters in discipleship. This is an update of the Torah portion readings and feedings. And you can download it for free from www.lojsociety.org. And it has an update of the previous Torah portion readings and feedings, some amendments and some corrections, and the footnotes that actually point out what was changed and, and the reason, the basic general reason why. So please download the weekly Torah portion readings and feedings from our main website and, and stay in tune, stay up to date. As well as, along with this, we want to point out um, the Rastafari Hebraic year, 81 AB. You understand that we're in the Zemena, we're in the Zemena um, Johannes Wengalawi. So this document right here, and this seven-page document right here, um, basically gives us the the western the western calendar calculation the western calendar calculation for our Moedim the Alatat our Hebraic our Hebraic base holy days and 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 times and season in this luni solar the luni solar cycle of um Torah readings and feeding now time the issue of time is a very very important matter and issue, the whole issue of time. What is time? Um, haven't you felt like something is deja vu, like we're living in time, the so-called deja vu, what people call it, like you've seen this before, or it's like a repeat of time. And we did a, a brief series on Twilight Zone of Time, and we was able to post um, a, a couple of them up there, but there's a couple of other more expanded teachings on that that we haven't posted up there as of yet and hopefully we'll have an opportunity in this upcoming uh summit what is known in the west as a week we call it a summit or subae from the greek from from the from the good is actually from the good is subae from the good is um and that's the 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 six seven the, well the seven days but the Sabbath actually is the end of the week, but it's also the beginning because I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. So in our Hebraic way, both the ending and the beginning are very intimately connected. You, you always, in, in order to go to the new, you have to go through that gate. And if you don't get to that gate, you kind of keep, like one person said to me recently, oh, I'm going forward. I think I must have mentioned backward. And you know how we as Rastafari on some points. And that's a true point about forward. But I said to the brother, I said, you're going forward in a circle. Think about it for a moment. If you're going forward in a circle, then you're making cipher. Now, really, it's whether it's just a circle going round and round or whether it's a spiral. You see, a spiral, therefore, there's a sense as well as there's descent. You know, there's, there's like a Jacob's Ladder, and that's what we touched on, the Jacob's Ladder portion, the reading and feeding. So at this particular time, what we would like to do, in order to get into Miketz, and Miketz, which is the, which is the tenth Sabbath, and this is the third day of the Hanukkah. We mentioned it a little bit earlier, but this is the third day of the Hanukkah. Now, the Hanukkah, there are European traditions to Hanukkah that we study, we investigate, we're, we're knowledgeable of, but we recognize that most of these don't have a real scriptural foundation. They are related some way to certain things.
that have something to do with the scripture or the general sense. But when we get into our study of the Hanukkah, the Hanukkah is a seven-day initiation. It's, it's about the light and the illumination. When the story of Hanukkah says that uh, a day's worth of oil, like a vial worth of oil, lasted actually for, for seven to eight days, were, were eight days of illumination. In other words, where a little bit, by the grace of the Almighty became a lot. The same thing is with the light and the illumination of the teaching of His Majesty, of the testimony of Jesus Christos. It's not whether you know all of these languages fluently or perfectly, and, but it's about that, 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 that little bit of truth being properly grounded. In other words, do you know what you know? Because if you know what you know and what you know is true, that will continue to be a guide and lead you to more truth. You know, but so it is very important in our perception as well, you know, because we're in this Western society and a lot of misconceptions and misperceptions are given. And a part of the rebirth, a part of that repenting and that rebirth and that baptism, because ones have asked about baptism and the real spiritual level of baptism is about immersing yourself just like the whole act of baptism is interesting as well too because um, many people believe that's just by sprinkling some water now they have these little skeet these, these little skeet jars where they skeet you with some water and this reminds me of what they do with teachings you know the Christian teaching nowadays they just skeet somebody with water. They don't really put them in the water. They don't really put their head under water. In other words, you have to, in other words, it's, it's, it's like about a death and a resurrection even coming out of that water. The same thing is getting into the teachings and the discipleship. Part of the discipleship aspect is, of course, it begins with that baptism. In other words, it's going in the water deep and, and, and immersing oneself in that spiritual water, which for us is the word. And although we have other responsibilities, many of us, and some have, have families and other social structures that they are responsible for, and they might not have a lot of time to do it in, in, in the so-called week as maybe others of us who are on a more priestical, disciplinal level. But the Sabbath time, the seventh day, that one-seventh of our time that belongs to him that he actually is made for our benefit, is very important to keep from the even, from eve to eve, from Friday even to Saturday even, and to avoid and be careful of the weekends and that which weakens us, weakens our spiritual, our psychological, and even our physical constitution. All right? So with that being said, let us move forward with this particular Torah portion, reading and feeding, that is known as Mikkets. But before we go forward, let us, let us review. We want to review. Let us review. And we want to review, um, I'm going to wrap up with our wrap up for this as we get into the scripture. Amen. Amen. Baruchu. Amen. Okay, so let's get into this portion, which is the tenth portion. We're gonna just connect it with the ninth, which is from the last the last uh the last summit or quote week, which is is Tekemetet. So let's go to the board right here. We're gonna we're going to call this the RSS uh, number 9 to 10. 9 to 10. We're in the 10th. We're in the 10th Sabbath since the Simchat Torah of the Fishcha Orit, Yorit Desita, Joy of the Torah, which begins the cycle. And we're going to put Te, E, Me, Te, Tu, Be, be hua la me. Put the me in there right here. So this is 
Right, so in the Hebrew, it's known as Vayeshev or Vayeshev to Miket. Vayeshev to Miket. And let's put that right here. Vayeshev. Vayeshev to Miket. Something to Miket. Right, so this is. This is the Amharic, the A, and this is the H, this is the Hebrew right here. All right? Now, this means uh, he sat or, or, or he sat or he dwelt, and this means after, and, and, and after, and, and afterward, or at the end. Now, let's get a summary. Let's get a summary by actually going over, we're going to go to the, about a shit uh, the Hebrew book of Genesis to this compilation right here that we pointed out before. And we're at Miketz right here, but let's go to the chapter before Vayashev. Now, Vayashev is the Hebrew for, and he lived, or in the sense of, and he dwelt. Like, and he literally, Bamaringa, and he sat. Now, we're going to also touch on the Gutters as we go forward, but this is just to get a basic overview. Um, and this is the ninth weekly portion in the Hebrew, the annual Hebrew cycle of the Torah reading, the Orit and the Bab, and it constitutes Genesis 37 and 1 to Genesis 40, 23. Hebrews in a diaspora read it in the ninth Sabbath after the Simchat Torah, generally in December. And now the overview, the overview or the summary, three basic summaries. First, it introduces Joseph, Yosef. Yosef, Eusef, Iusef, the dreamer, Judah and Tamar, the story of Judah and Tamar, and Joseph and Potiphar, or Potiphar, Potiphar the Egyptian. Now we go to Miket, Miket or the Khalam, it means in the Hebrew, Miket means at the end. The Khalam means and afterwards, and afterwards. It's the second word, the first distinctive word of the kufl or the parasha, the portion. And it's the 10th weekly Torah portion, parasha, in the annual Hebraic or Jewish cycle of Torah readings. And it constitutes Genesis 41 and 1 to Genesis 44 and 17. Now, we as Hebrews and black Jews in the diaspora, we read this in the 10th Sabbath after the Simchat Torah. And it says, generally, it is read on the Sabbath of Hanukkah. So this is the Sabbath of uh, Hanukkah um, right now. We're in that particular portion between the eves, between the evens, the eve, the evening of Friday, because we avoid the weekend, you know, the eve of Friday to the eve of, of, of Saturday. Now, when Hanukkah contains two Sabbaths, they say it is read on the second. In some years, however, Miket is read on the Sabbath after Hanukkah. So according to certain communities, they would read it on the Sabbath after, after the Hanukkah, which for us would be um, like next Sabbath. So some Jews might choose this year to do that as well. But we're choosing to go through this at this present time. Now, the summary, is, the summary for this portion is Pharaoh's dream. Pharaoh's dream. Joseph the provider, Joseph's brother's journey to Egypt, and the brother's return to Egypt. That's the summary of this particular um, portion for this week. So in connecting it with um, Vayashev, 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 or Tekemet, we're going to go through the Strong's, um, or the Schofield, or rather the Schofield, uh, reference Bible. Let's just put a put a mark right here in the book, so we can come back to that portion as as needed. And we're gonna go to uh, Genesis 37. Now, in Genesis 37, the last portion that I think we had touched on um, from the Schofield uh, uh, the Schofield study notes was roughly around was the Jacob and Israel. 
Jacob and name Jacob and name Israel and the wrestling. That was the uh, previous portion that we went into a little bit of detail on. And in scrolling forward, there's other elements here that can be and should be studied, even independently. One can, you know, choose, I want to learn a little more about this or that. And there are those areas in the scriptures. But what we're going to present right here is the God of Bethel. The God of Bethel. Now, it's important for us, even though the God of Bethel part is in Lake, we need to touch on Bethel or Bethel. Then we have Benjamin, which means the son of uh, of my right hand. Now, some say that the Ethiopians, we've heard some say that the Ethiopians are not Judahites. They say instead they are Benjamites. And, and this is interesting as well. Well, Benjamin and Judah, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, merged together under the banner of Judah. And this is in um, Hebrew history. Now, what we're going to touch on first is the Bethel, is Bethel. Let's, let us deal with Bethel for a moment. What does the name mean? Now, Beit, right, plus L equals Beitel, all right? So let's put it in English. Beit, now the, this is a hidden Y is there. So we usually write this plus L. Now this is the E kind of the E sound, but there's a hidden Y there. So with E, Y, L, or sometimes you'll see it with that, with that Karen type um, phonetic mark right there. And this would be B, E, Y, T, E, Y, L, or usually like this. Now, of course, usually they write it like this, Bethel, with a suck. And this come from the Ashkenazi or the German, the European Jews, add in that that su, that su sound because of their particular um, pronunciation. But in the Ethiopic, we don't have a th, we don't have a th sound such as such as such as that. So we just have it as a t, a t. So it it, it will be it will be um, uh, bay tell. Now, bait, bait means house or enclosure, or one can say the abode. The abode is the, the bait. And then L is God, or L actually, let's deal with this right here. When we say L, right, when we say L in, in uh, Hebrew, we are saying in the Amharic, Hayel. You understand? Know We're saying Hayel. Or you might find in some version Ha L. Ha L, which would be H A E L. And, and we did some video on teaching on that Ha L. And Ha L is the Hebraic, is the closest to the Hebraic of, of Hayel. But when we say L in Hebrew, or from the Hebrew, we are saying Ethiopically Hayel. Chaya, which means the power, the strong one, or that sense of, of, of overpowering or prevailing over. You understand? Or that God's power, or that, 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 strong, that strong power, the strong one. So we have house, bait, and ale, house of ale, house of God. Now what does the Schofield tell us here in the footnote? And we're in chapter 35, and we're kind of actually going back to the eighth sabbatical portion. It's all connected. It's just that these particular portions allows us for on a level, a kind of bite-sized, you know, bite-sized tasting of the word. It's almost like our, our daily bread, but, but in a sense, our sabbatical meal, the, the spiritual part from, from and through the word. So it means the, the God of Bethel, Right, it says the God of Bethel, and there's a link comparison to Genesis chapter 28 and 19. It says, there it was the place as the scene of the latter vision which impressed Yaakov. Now, some say this ladder actually, Jacob's ladder, it could have been an extraterrestrial and a flying saucer, and the ladder was actually that ladder, that runway that the aliens or the extraterrestrials would walk down. 
which is kind of interesting. We'll touch on that. But he called the place Bethel, the house of God. Now, it is the God of the place rather than the place, and he calls it El Bethel. He actually calls it not just Bethel, but El Bethel, El Bethel, El Bethel, or El Bethel, El Bethel, the God of the house of God, the, the God of the house. Now, there's another footnote here, and we put this up here because we want you to reference this because it's very important now to understand this metaphysically. So we're going to go to the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary for Betha. And this is kind of how we instruct the disciples and others if they're studying, whether individually or collectively, to do this basic groundwork. In other words, go to the major references, for example, the Schofield Reference Bible, um, the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, or the Strong's Concordance, to understand in its context the meaning of the name. What is the meaning of the Shem? What is the meaning of the Shem? It's called word, sound, and power. That's, that's the scientific formula, basically, for us on the level of Rastafari science or metaphysics on that sort of, um, that sort of perspective to this. So Bethel, the house of God, the town was originally named Lutz, Luz. Luz, L-U-Z. So make a note of that, because what does Luz mean? We, we must know, because that was the former name of that particular town. It is situated a few miles north of Jerusalem. So it's north of Jerusalem. Genesis 28 and 19, Genesis 35, 1 to 15. Now, metaphysically, Luz means turning away, departing. So Luz means a turning away or a departing. That which seems separate and apart is brought into unity, and the name is then Bethel. In the individual, Bethel refers to a certain center near the heart. There's a certain center. When we speak about the seven seals in man, there's a certain center. One may say a chakra that's near the heart, which is called in Judaic and Christian metaphysics, and this is the level of Kabbalah. One asks about the Kabbalah for us to touch on the Kabbalah. Well, this is what we're touching on when we're teaching this teaching in this particular manner of Rastafari overstanding. We are touching on the true Kabbalah, the true reception of the teaching of His Majesty. So there is a center near the heart that is called the house of God or Betel. It seems material. So when we talk about Bethel, Bethel may seem material. Now, Bethel is linked in, in, in our Ethiopian, in the renewing of the kingdom of David in Ethiopia. Aksum, which is north of Addis Ababa, would be in our African of Sion, would be as our Bethel. So let's, let's make that note right there so one can understand, well, what is the... The significance. So we have Bethel right here. Let's put right here Oxum. We're going to spell with an X, though it's more correctly K S, because it's A K S U M from Wagshum, from Wagshum. But that's another etymological um, study right there. So it seems material. It seems to be a material thing, you know? At first sight, Yaiko thought that it was material. He thought that it was a material thing. Remember, Yaiko represents the, the natural man, the blessed but natural man. It's like I make the likeness of saying that Jacob is us as just Negroes or as black folks. We're like Jacob a lot. He's blessed, but he's like a slick willy too. You understand? He's like a heel grabber. Yovis, and he has a blessing of a new name, but he, he, is, he trepidates to walk in that new name, that new name Israel, that he has wrestled with God and with man, and he prevails, but he still is going through a lot of, um, a lot of the repercussions for his evil deeds. You understand? And his lack of faith and his fearfulness, but he is still blessed. 
So Jacob would represent the old Negro, the old black. So now when we understand that and we're reading the story and studying it and seeing the real nature of Jacob, we can see that old Negro. Now when we look at Israel, Israel would represent that Ethiopian, the Ethiopian Hebrew. When we look at look at it as Israel or in the election as Rastafari. Now this is this is what makes the, the teaching for us gives resonance to these teachings. Because people say, well, how is this applicable to us? Okay, it's Bible study, but how does it really is applicable? Once you can understand and understand that the Jacob is the black God, and it's not just we that say this, it's others that have studied and looked at the story, even Macy, Gerald Macy, in his first book, he goes into some exquisite details concerning many of these groundational and foundational patriarchs as well as themes in some of our earlier um, previous uh, Torah portion reading, feeding videos and lectures, we've gone into some of the, the references and try to make some links so that ones can have a reference point if they want to study and understand or overstand these points much better for themselves. So Aksum, or the Beit El, the house of God to Jacob, and remember we have the obelisk, the stellas, the circumcised, um, howlet, the circumcised stellas and obelisk, which are different than the uncircumcised obelisk of Egypt, as well as the ones like Washington Monument that's uncircumcised, Ethiopian obelisk or howlet or stellas, they're circumcised. And there's an important reference to that particular matter, even on the mystical, metaphysical, and even getting to the extraterrestrial or celestial level. But first, let's get, to, let's get a good groundation on it. So it seemed material at first sight, and Yaakov or Jacob thought that it was material when he lay down there with a stone for a pillow. And in the previous video, we touched on Jacob and Bob Marley's song and, 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 and the kind of a link with this theme. But he found there a ladder. He found there now the steps. The ladder represents those ascending and descending steps. He found the ascending steps, the ascending degrees to the Shamayim or to the Samayat, to the heavens or to the Samai, the heaven. And he exclaimed, this is what Jacob exclaimed, surely Yahweh, or perhaps he said Ha Elohim, since Yahweh was not known, some say, to them at that particular time, but we'll clarify this as well. The who, who is Jehovah in that sense? Surely Jehovah is in this place, and I knew it not. Genesis 28:16 to 22. So Beit or Beth El really symbolizes a consciousness. It symbolizes a consciousness, a mindfulness. Remember to keep. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, to keep it set apart. Remember. So here, Bethel really symbolizes, is a symbol of a consciousness or a mindfulness of God, of the true God or the God of truth. Or it's a conscious unity. It's a conscious unity, not an unconscious. Many of us have an unconscious unity or relationship with God, with the Bible, with, with the testimony of Christ. We remember it as the situation. It's not a, we haven't made that decision. See, the disciples, a disciple has made a conscious decision, so therefore it's a conscious unity with Ha Elohim. And this is now what we have symbolized in Yaakov or in Jacob, even the wrestling. You see the wrestling with the angel that brought about the new name? Now that is interesting because Jacob was wrestling with circumstances and situations. Like many of us are wrestling with our own uh, Jacob-like, Jacobite circumstances and situations on different levels. And we are having um, interaction with truth and the God of truth, whether we are conscious of it or whether we are unconscious, whether we can see God coming forward or only see his backward parts. Yovas, we still are having some relationship with 
the truth and with the God of truth. But the key thing is to become conscious of it, to become mindful. So remembering the Sabbath, it gives us an opportunity for mindfulness. Now what one does when one remembers the Sabbath, that, that, that is a matter that the Almighty generally leaves up to the individual. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it, yet take as I said, to keep it set apart, to keep it holy. Now, one has to ask himself, well, I'm remembering it. Now, how can I remember it? That's the first part is to remember it. So it may take you some weeks just remembering it's a Sabbath. Oh, this is a Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom, brethren. Sendet Salam. You know, even though one may not be doing anything in particular, but they remember it. They say, okay, it's the weekend, but that weakens me. I'm tired of that, it, you know, so I'm going to remember the. So I'm just going to just, just rest. Maybe one just sleep or just take a, you know, just chill for a moment. But now as one goes over that commandment again in their mind, remember it to keep it set apart. Now, how do I keep it holy? When one starts to ask themselves, what does holy mean? And truth, what does holy really mean? That's the beginning of a consciousness because it, you have to find the answer, as Haile Selassie has taught us, find the truth for yourself. The reason why he published the Metaf Kedus, the Book of the Seven Seals, the Bible, you understand, is that Ethiopians may find the truth for themselves. So it's about us finding the truth before ourselves. So I may teach you something. I may teach this or that, but you have to meditate on this and, and seriously. And I think, well, I think that that's wrong, but you haven't thought on it. You haven't checked it out. But check it out for yourself and define the truth for yourself. This is, is part of the consciousness. It's not a destination. It is, it is a process. It's a procedure. It becomes as a way. Discipline of the mind is the basic ingredient of genuine morality and therefore a spiritual strength. And the King of Kings go on to teach us that that spiritual strength, spiritual power is the essential thing because the tripartite man is reliant on that spiritual power first and foremost. But the world tells us body and soul. They tell us mind and body. So they keep our mind on our body, on the material. That's why Jacob looked at it. Jacob saw it as material as, at first. That's why we compare Jacob in the overstanding to the black man, to the Negro, to the Negro mentality black man. Now, when he comes into the Israelitish consciousness, this is part of that rebirth. So when we look at how Jacob walked with that new name. He, he didn't use it like Abraham used that new name. And we find Abraham and others immediately using their new name. While he still, um, he trepidated. Sometimes he used, like if you read in the scripture, some places will say Jacob. And then some places it will say Israel. But it rarely says Israel, and there's a difference between the usage of Jacob and the usage of Israel. And the video that we did, the teaching we did on that, we'll recommend that to ones and ones. If you haven't checked out that one, it's a, it's a recent one on Jacob and Israel, on looking at the name, the Shem of Jacob and Israel, the contrast of the so-called Negro, you understand, and the new Negro or the Ethiopian, the Hebrew. And we can see that within our story here, vis-a-vis -vis our kinsman, the Redeemer, Kedamawi, Hila, Salase. So, Bethel really symbolizes a consciousness of God and a conscious unity with Ha Elohim. With Ha Elohim. Now, in this same portion, because we're going, we're kind of um, retrograding a little bit, so we can bounce forward. We have Benjamin, and there's a there's a link down here with Benjamin. And we just will go through the, the Benjamin. Binyam, Bamarinya Binyam, or Benjamin, means uh, son of the right hand. Now, Benjamin, originally, quote, son of sorrow, was he was son of sorrow to his mother, to Rachel. But he was the son of my right hand to his father. So he becomes a double type of Christ. So even like in ancient Egypt, we have this, in ancient Egyptian theology and eschatology, we have this idea of a, of, of a dual 
a kind of a dualism, you understand, of, 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 a, of a duality. You understand that to the mother, to the mother side of the tree, you understand, he was son of sorrow. To the father side of the tree, he was son of the Yamin, of the Yemen, the Yemen, the Yamin, or Bamarinya, the Yemen, which is the right hand. Remember the black power and the black power struggle when they put up the fist? They put up that black fist. That right hand black fist, it's the Ya or the Ye, Bamarinya, and in the, in the, in the Hebrew, it's the Yad. That's the right hand. That's what that, that, that symbol means. So when it says, son of my right hand, ben, ben, yamin, ben, yaman, ben, yamin, ben, yam, by contraction in the Ethiopic, it means son of my right hand. So he becomes a double type of Moshiach. So Benjamin actually is a type of Christ. He's a type of Moshiach. This is important. Many people they kind of gloss over these, these, these particular, these details. These details are very, very important. So is Ethiopia really not Judah but Benjamin? Still, it is a type of Christ, all the same. As Bain Oni, which is the other side, the maternal side of it, it is son of sorrow. He was the suffering one. He was the suffering one because of whom a sword had pierced his mother's heart. And we have Luke chapter 2, verse 35. So as a type of Christ, he was like that scene in Luke's gospel, chapter 2, verse 35. Now as Ben-Yamin or Benjamin, as son of the right hand, he was head of the warrior tribe. So now we have a beautiful link with Benjamin, you understand, and Jamaica. Benjamin and the Caribbean, Benjamin and the West Indies, according to the black Hebrew Israelites and the black Jewish tribal relation of the first four tribes. And we're going to take the first three to four tribes, Judah, Afro-American, so-called Negro. Benjamin now is the so-called Caribbean or the West Indian black folks, is under Benjamin. Now, notice the connection. Benjamin, on the farther side of it, he is the head of the warrior tribe, according to Genesis chapter 49, verse 27. He is firmly, firmly joined with Judah. Now, Judah represents the kingly, the kingly tribe. Now, notice Judah is the African-American Negro, right? So when you think of king, what's the first king you think? You think of Martin Luther King. And this particular Mikhet is dealing with Pharaoh's dream. So really, the dream of Dr. King, whose dream was it really? Think about it. And that's why we point out that CNN video. And we're coming out for a new video and going into some more detail. Perhaps we'll post some of the portions up there so one can at least get an idea, though they might already have an idea of where we're going with that teaching. So Benjamin is the head of the warrior tribe. He is firmly joined to Yehuda or Judah, the kingly tribe. He becomes a type of the victorious one. He becomes a type, a verbal hieroglyph, in a sense, of the victorious one or of the Moa, the Moa, the Moa on Besa, the Ima, Negeda, Yehuda, of the Ashinafi, of the overcomer, of the conquering lion, of the prevailer, the one who hath prevailed. Now, it's noteworthy that Benjamin was especially honored. Benjamin was given a special honor among the Gentiles. And we see also coming from the Caribbean, coming from the tribe of Benjamin, we see also a special honor, whether we see it through Rastafari or through the reggae music on that particular level. Benjamin, even in this very time, also getting a special honor as well. So this is a further um, confirmation of other aspects of the teaching of his majesty and his Christ. Now, so manifold, that means on many different levels, are the distinctions of Christos, of the Moshiach, that many personal types of him are needed because the Messiah is so much. You understand? He's, so, he's the fullness, all in all, that there are many personal types that we have here in Torah, that we have here in the Bible and in the scriptures 
are needed to give us verbal hieroglyphics, you understand, symbolic types and parables so that we can become conscious of this and grow up into him in all things, into the fullness. So many types are needed. Now, Joseph, Joseph, who we're going to go into a little more detail, who these particular sabbatical portion readings and feedings, in fact, from here to, um, to, to the end of the book of Genesis, is actually strictly dealing with Joseph. Joseph becomes the, the center and the central character in this portion of our Torah portion readings and themes. So Yosef is most complete. He is most complete. Binya standing only for Christ. Binya, now Benjamin, he stands for Christ, but in what aspect? In what aspect does Benjamin stand for Christ as the sorrowful one? Now this is interesting that Burhana Selassie, Bob Marley, a Benjamite, you understand, and the Jamaican Rastafari and other West Indian Rastafari Benjamites, that they, the, the music, you notice Bob Marley called it, Bob Marley and the Wailers, the Wailers. And he said, how, how, how did you get to sing? He said he didn't consider himself singing, he considered himself crying, that he was crying from the womb. He was wailing. So we have this example, this beautiful, this is a beautiful example of the sorrowful type. So we're looking at the black Hebrew Israelites who break down the 12 tribes of Israel and looking at, the, at, at, at those four, those first four, beginning with Judah, you understand, the Afro-American Negro, so-called Negro, right? And then we have Benjamin as the Jamaican, the West Indian Negro, as, or the West Indian black, as the, as one, or the West Indian, the Caribbean black. Now, through that Caribbean black and Benjamin, signified mainly by Jamaica. Jamaica would be the head of that contingent, of that particular tribe. Everything that we have here scripturally and biblically in this Torah portion, in these portion readings and feeding, link also in the reality. So we have God and history and the real story bearing witness, resonance, one to one and the same reality, in fact. This is what's so beautiful. Even the last part right here where Joseph is the most complete and Benjamin standing only for Christ, the sorrowful one, yet to have power. He is yet to have power or authority on earth. You see, he's yet to have power and authority on earth. So that was to sum up this part, because we felt that we wanted to do a better groundation to the ninth portion. You understand the ninth portion, and now we ask that to go back to the eighth portion. And those who have downloaded the present sabbatical reading and feeding, um, the Sabbath house reading or the weekly Torah portion, weekly Sabbath readings from our website, no doubt would have looked at number eight, where we had to make an update from what formerly was Azizacho. And we have a video out there under that particular title. And we said that in the former version, we had Azizacho partly due to the verse being different from the key Hebraic word that actually occurs in the Amharic original in the preceding verse. So if you study the Hebrew carefully, sometimes the numbering is a little bit differently because the Jews sometimes number the verses in some areas a little bit different, a little bit differently. So that threw us off for a moment, and the Spirit pointed it out to us, and we immediately went through a, a, a upgrade of this particular document, and this is why we've been so um, continuous on seeking to remind in almost every video that we're putting out right now, please download the, the, the recent one, the updated one, because it has additional information besides that right there. So that was Latke. So the more correct for the eighth portion would be Latke, which links with Vayishlak. Vayish lak. So we say the Vayish, you have lak. And from the from the Amharic it's Lake, which means he sent. And this portion here that we're touching on um uh Bethel, Bethel, um Bethel, uh son of my son of my right hand. There's one other point that we didn't make right here. If you're looking at the footnote on page fifty one of the Schofield uh, reference Bible, you'll see that the, the first mention of the drink offering, 
you know, and this is another thing that, and this is also to prove that we are Hebrews, black people, because we still do these things. We already pointed out the Benjamin link right there, even the Judah and the Jacob link as well. But even the drink offering, what we know, and in some um, Afrocentric circles, they call libations. It's called libations. And that's the drink offering. So here in the scripture, in chapter 35, we have the first mention of the drink offering. And there's some interesting notes here that we wanted to share before we move forward in this, in, in, in this uh, teaching right here. It's on um, the drink offering. It says, it is not mentioned among the Levitical offerings of Leviticus chapter 1 to Leviticus chapter 7. So we have chapter 1 to chapter 7 of the Levitical offerings, and there's no mention of the drink offering, which is interesting. Though it's included in the instructions for sacrifice in the land. However, the drink offering is included for the instructions concerning sacrifice, the mesuat, in the land. There's some things that we cannot do in exile because we are not in the land, and the precondition is when ye be in the land, which Yahweh Eloheinu gives us, then ye shall keep this and keep this in this way and do that. But here it says that the drink offering was included in the instructions for sacrifice in the land according to Numbers chapter 15, 15 verses 5 to 7. Listen, Sima, Sima. It, it was always poured out, quote, it was always, quote, poured out, end quote. Never drank. So the drink offering, such so the libations, and many, and many of y'all, I don't know how many of y'all, you know, uh, where you grew up or where you was at, but I know among I and I and some of I and I former homies, you know, for for brethren who passed on or sometime for all the homies who are not here, tap the bottle twice or thrice, you know, and open it up and pour out a little bit on the ground, so forth and so on, and this is for so and so and, and also the Afrocentrics and many of the Afrocentric brothers and sisters and lecturers, even Brother Bobby Hammond often does the libation. The other ones do the libation for the ancestors, for the gods, for those who are not here, so forth and so on. But here in the scriptures, in chapter 35, we have an interesting example of the drink offering and how it was not under the Levitical offerings, but it was included later on in the book of Numbers, Concerning the instructions for sacrifice, quote, in the land, when we, get, when we enter into the land, and it was always poured out, it was never drank. It was never drank. And it may be considered, it may be considered scripturally, eschatologically, that means from a scriptural, spiritual kind of a, a, a point of view, it may be considered a type of Christ. Uh, you know, it was a mythological, we're speaking about mystical and a mythological type of Christ is the libation, the pouring, the pouring out. In the sense of Psalm 22, verse 14, and Isaiah 53 and 12. Now we're going to move forward from there, but we wanted just to add that portion about the libation and the, and the, um, the drink offering. Now we're going to continue with this, but this is this is mainly focusing on Bethel, Bethel, the Axum link, as well as more on Jacob and some of the other key points and matters about the different persons and personalities. So that when you are reading, studying, or meditating and teaching your children, sharing this with them, that your head and your heart can be open to receive the truth. That the basic instructions, some of the basic elements will be a little more clearer, and the modern prophetic resonances, which I, I find to be a, a extremely amazing and interesting, even the point about Benjamin, um, is there as well. So stay tuned. Some more to come. All right, my brothers and sisters? Shalom. <laughs>